One of the worst among these agents of the center is the Tamil Nadu Governor R. N. Ravi. Blatant violation of the model code of conduct. Tamil Nadu and Kerala have always given the BJP's hopes and prospects short shrift. Nothing against Hindi as a language, as leaders of the Dravidian movement and others have made clear, but imposition is something that the people of Tamil Nadu and possibly some other southern states and will not tolerate. To majoritarian, or to be more precise, a Hindu supremacist agenda that mo makes no secret of its intent to consolidate political power along the lines worked out by the ideologues of Hindutva and Hindu Rashtra. The or hero worship in politics to which he thought Indians were particularly addicted. Five million lives in India was officially declared. That five million the official toll is a small fraction, about one-ninth of the actual mortality during the uh, pandemic as independently estimated. The Hindu rights anti-democratic and anti-secular playbook and the strongman style of centralized and personalized rule. The Election Commission of India and the Supreme Court of India, which in the assessment of some lawyer and jurist critics has been turned largely into an executive court. Anti-terror, sedition, and other draconian laws to incarcerate without bail or trial and for prolonged periods, journalists, students, human rights defenders, civil society activists, and troublesome critics of the government. Surveillance against a large number of journalists, politicians, civil society activists, and other selected targets by deploying NSO's military-grade spyware Pegasus. In one stroke, Jammu and Kashmir's special autonomous status went up in smoke. It was robbed of its statehood. And what we have now are two union territories ruled with an iron hand. The temple is coming up on the grave of the Babri Masjid, a 16th century Mughal era mosque, says the guiding center of Hindu supremacist and communal activities in India. Mr. Modi is nothing without the RSS. RSS's historical vote share of 35.6% over 17 Lok Sabha elections is significantly higher than the BJP's 21.85% over 10 Lok Sabha elections. Mr. Modi's closeness to the billionaire Gautam Adani, the Adani group of companies. So instead of investigating somebody who's been accused of accounting fraud and uh, various other illegalities, it found fault with the whistleblower, the investigator. The whole electoral bonds were designed for opacity, was defined for cover-up. The subject today is the present political situation, and uh, I will speak on the values at stake, drawing material from what is happening all around us. And uh, Prabhakar said he would speak on the political economy of, uh, of the pre present political situation. And of course, he will also touch on the values. What are these values at stake? First, the Republican Constitution and its integral values, its spirit, and also its letter these represent the core values of India's long struggle for independence from British colonial rule and its quest for freedom in the fullest sense. Secondly, the diverse, pluralistic, and secular character of India and its historical civilization versus Hindutva ideology and the Hindu Rashtra project. This also encompasses the rights of minorities, especially Muslims, but also others, including linguistic minorities. Three, our parliamentary democracy, however imperfect, and the forces defending it, ranged against what we would, I would like to call the Hindutva authoritarian regime. Four, equality before the law, guaranteed by Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, which reads, and I quote, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws 
within the territory of India, not just any citizen, any person. Five, freedom of speech and expression guaranteed by Article 19.1a of the Constitution and also other democratic freedoms which are part of fundamental rights and these are embattled in India today or in an embattled state. Six, the interdependence of the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar brought out clearly and powerfully in his last speech to the Constituent Assembly of India on November 25, 1949. He also emphasized the importance of getting what he termed the Union of, Territory, uh, Union of Trinity right. He warned against internal threats to democracy and society, such as bhakti or hero worship in politics, to which he thought Indians were particularly addicted. It's quite possible, he mused, for, our, for this newborn democracy to retain its form, but give place to dictatorship in fact. I, this, is, um, this is part of a quotation. If there is a landslide, he said, and he was no doubt referring to an electoral landslide, the danger of the second possibility become actuality is much greater. In support of his argument, Dr. Ambedkar recalled John Stuart Mill's famous caution to people interested in the maintenance of democracy not to, within quotes, lay their liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with powers which enable him to subvert their institutions. This is very relevant to what is happening today when the Hindutva authoritarian regime seeks to go on the rampage, even during the election campaign. What are we ranged against? The image that comes to my mind instantly is Namaste Trump, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's signature extravaganza to welcome and celebrate then US President Donald Trump in Ahmedabad in February 2020. It was a spectacle worthy of this age of strongmen Trump and Modi locked in a bear hug in a festival of mutual admiration and triumphalism at the world's largest cricket stadium, the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad. This was a month, this is important, the timing. This was a month after the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. And this was barely before the pandemic that eventually claimed an estimated at least 5 million lives in India was officially declared. That 5 million, the official toll is a small fraction, about one-ninth of the actual mortality during the uh, pandemic as independently estimated. Modi and Trump have uh, strikingly different social and political backgrounds and somewhat different governance and personal styles. But what they do have in common is a, are an uncanny ability to work crowds up into a frenzy, a, sta a taste for the grandiose and delusions of grandeur, and most importantly, an authoritarian disdain for their constitutions and the values, spirit, and even the letter of these foundational charters. In their book, India's first dictatorship, the emergency 1975-77, Christoph Jafferlal and Pratinav Anil argue that the emergency of 1975-1977, I'm old enough to remember what happened to the emergency, and some of us actually fought, tried to fight, uh, fight it in our own ways, but uh, they argue that the emergency was a concentrate of a style of rule, an Ilan available today, and that this involves a dialectical relationship between populism and authoritarianism. It is this potent mixture of populism, some st self-styled economic development credentials. I, I won't go into that. I leave that to Dr. Prabhakar. I know that he, he will certainly, that will be one of his the focal points of his address when he speaks about the political economy uh, in the present political situation. The Hindu rights anti-democratic and anti-secular playbook 
and the strongman style of centralized and personalized rule. It is this that has enabled Mr. Narendra Modi to catapult himself from the chief ministership of Gujarat to the top political job in the country. Since coming to power, his BJP government has actively pursued a Hindu majoritarian, or to be more precise, a Hindu supremacist agenda that makes no secret of its intent to consolidate political power along the lines worked out by the ideologues of Hindutva and Hindu Rashtra. And towards this end, the BJP regime under, under Mr. Modi has taken the path of incremental authoritarianism, softening up and wherever possible, suborning constitutional and democratic institutions and undermining India's already stressed secular foundations. These are not just generalizations. Let me list some of the actions and trends in support of this generalization. First, strikes against democracy and secularism. A core concern is the way the government has brought executive power to bear on the independence of two constitutionally empowered institutions, constitutionally provided and empowered institutions, the Election Commission of India and the Supreme Court of India, which in the assessment of some lawyer and jurist critics has been turned largely into an executive court. We have a distinguished lawyer here, my friend Sri Ram Panchu, and there may be others who, uh, who of course, have written on uh, what's, gone wrong with the what's gone wrong with the judiciary. Now there are also bright spots, some judgments that we greatly appreciate, particularly the judgment on electoral bonds and so on. But by and large, the judiciary, in the words of these critics, has been turned, the higher judiciary, into a, and the Supreme Court in particular, into an executive court. Now let me give you the examples, cite some examples of where the election commission is, because that's a very topical area. We're going to, the Tamil Nadu is going to the polls on, uh, on the 19th. So what has the election commission da done? There is the model code of conduct, and paragraph one forbids parties and candidates from indulging in, quote, any activity which may aggravate existing differences or create material hatred or cause tension between different castes and communities, religious or linguistic. This is a, a quote. And what has uh, been the main substance of Prime Minister Modi's speeches at various rallies? The, this has been widely reported, sometimes critically, but sometimes uh, approvingly also, as though nothing has gone wrong in the media. The campaign of Narendra Modi. In a speech at, in Bihar on April 7th, Nevada, Bihar, Mr. Modi accused, uh, quote, the Congress and the BJD of making every effort to prevent the Grand Temple being built at Ayodhya. He said they boycotted the Pran Pratishtha and asked why this enmity to Lord Ram repeatedly has made this claim. I don't want to go into the details. A number of speeches have been reported in the press and the videos are available. And he attacked opposition parties, in particular the Congress, but also regional parties of, uh, uh, by not attending what the consecration at Ayodhya, they showed their enmity towards Lord Ram. And this is a blatant violation of the model code of conduct, in particular Para 1. There are all, uh, the, uh, the, and the CPIM has officially complained to the Election Commission of India, pointing out that this is not only a violation of the model code, and they cite chapter and verse, but also uh, a, a criminal, a, 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 a possible criminal offence, something that should be investigated under sections, relevant sections of the IPC. Menaka Gandhi, in a speech, is reported to have said that if Muslims do not vote for me, I will not help them when they come to me for jobs, etc. At least in that case, the district administration has served some notice. You will recall that in 2014, 
when Mr. Amit Shah, currently Home Minister, and then BJP President made some inflammatory speeches, the Election Commission pulled him up and in fact stopped him from attending rallies. He submitted an unqualified apology and then they let him off and allowed him to address election rallies. Not a satisfactory response to what had happened, a very serious violation. Because remember that a Muslim League MP was disqualified by the Kerala High Court for six years after he had made religious references, violating the uh, model code of conduct, so on. But uh, today, the Election Commission, apart from the, it's, uh, being, uh, you know, the issue of appointments, which lack transparency and independence, the, apart from that, it is, seems to be largely ineffective. And the Election Commission of India seems to have gone back to the pre-session age. Mr. Session empowered the Election Commission. Sometimes he overshot the map. Supreme Court pulled him up. But who can deny that Mr. Session empowered the Election Commission and made it an independent body, gave it some independence, and that independence is now not only being eroded, I can hardly see any signs of it. That's the one strike. That's a very serious matter. Two major constitutionally empowered institutions being disempowered and uh, virtually helpless. The Supreme Court, of course, not so. I, I was, uh, I've already said what the criticism is different, but so far as the Election Commission is concerned, it certainly lacks independence. But we shall see what the response is to this complaint made by the CPIM. Second, the government has conducted targeted assaults on freedom of expression, on media freedom and independence, and other fundamental rights. It has used anti-terror, sedition, and other draconian laws to incarcerate without bail or trial and for prolonged periods journalists, students, human rights defenders, civil society activists, and troublesome critics of the government. The post-2014 downslide in media freedom and independence has seen India sink from the rank of 140 in 2014 to 161 in 2023 among 180 countries and territories in the World Press Freedom Index published by Reporters Without Borders. It 161 among 180 countries lower than Pakistan. Three, in the decade 2014-2024, 19 journalists have been murdered in connection with their work across India, compared with 11 during the previous decade. Most of these murders have been committed against journalists reporting or investigating corruption, politics, crime, and human rights violations. There's no correlation between governments in power and these murders. That is, that is a fact. But research suggests that communal and other forms of divisive politics and social polarization across India have made an already bad situation worse. The BJP regime has deployed brutal force to suppress democratic protests, notably the December 2019 mass protests against a change in the citizenship laws discriminating against Muslims and prolonged and eventually successful agitation in 2020-21, demanding the repeal of three farm laws seen as favoring corporate India at the expense of farmers. The government, the central government, has systematically misused agencies of the state responsible for countering crime, corruption, income tax violations, and money laundering to go after political opponents including ministers, two chief ministers have been incarcerated, and legislators belonging to opposition parties in several states. The government has made a concerted effort to police and censor the internet, the social media, technology platforms that deliver content via internet-connected devices known as OTT platforms, and also try to restrict digital news providers. The government has almost certainly conducted 
illegal surveillance against a large number of journalists, politicians, civil society activists, and other selected targets by deploying NSO's military-grade spyware Pegasus. And this matter is still pending before the Supreme Court. The government has amended the citizenship laws to make Muslims, Muslim as distinct from non-Muslim migrants from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, ineligible for citizenship. And the significance of this is, for the first time, religion has been made a marker for citizenship, for the first time in the history of independent India. I won't go into the details of the NRC and the National Register of Citizens, because those are very serious issues which have been well covered. By abrogating without discussion in Parliament or with the political parties of the state, Article 370 of the Constitution, the Modi government has dealt a serious blow to the concept of federalism. In one stroke, Jammu and Kashmir's special autonomous status went up in smoke. It was robbed of its statehood, and what we have now are two union territories ruled with an iron hand from the center, the Jammu and Kashmir in particular, as a union territory. There's been an unprecedented crackdown on political parties. All democratic rights have been suspended, and media freedom has been virtually extinguished in the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. And last, in my list of examples, it's not an exhaustive list, the BJP government has made use of governors who are openly partisan to try and undermine elected state governments run by opposition parties, thus embittering center-state relations in several cases. And one of the very worst, arguably one of the, he competes with Arif Mohammed Khan in another in Kerala, one of the worst among these agents of the center is the Tamil Nadu governor R. N. Ravi. He, he has disgraced his constitutional post, tried to change the name of the state, listening to some, tried to remove a minister saying, he's, my pleasure is withdrawn, and for these he has been pulled up by the Supreme Court. There are many other things that are, go are going wrong here, and I don't want to take too much time, but uh, we cannot but comment on the authoritarian disdain from the secular and democratic for the secular and democratic constitution of India. That uh, what happened in Ayodhya on or around January 22nd, 2024. There, as you know, a massive temple is coming up on the grave of the Babri Masjid, a 16th century Mughal era mosque that was vandalized and razed to the ground on December 6, 1992 by hordes of Hindu, so-called Hindu activists brought together by organizations and leaders associated with the RSS, the guiding center of Hindu supremacist and communal activities in India. And on that day, Mr. Modi, Prime Minister Modi, played the nation's grand priest by leading the Pran Pratishtha rituals for Ram Lala, the child Lord Ram, after undergoing 11-day purification ritual that involved fasting and other austerities visiting temples across the country, inaugura inaugurating in between a big development project or two, and most importantly, mobilizing majoritarian sentiment with an eye to the coming general election. And as you know, this Ram Temple has been made the center of his own personalized election campaign, which, as I mentioned, directly is uh, in violation or the model code of conduct and some sections of the IPC. The line separating religion, the state and politics laid down within India's constitutional framework and reinforced by the Supreme Court in a 1994 judgment, the Bombay judgment, stood erased in an unbounded show of majoritarian power. I just want to ask, who is Mr. Modi? Without going into excessive detail or anything personal, I would suggest that despite the impression of being all-powerful, he's not quite his own man. We have to understand it. 
Mr. Modi is nothing without the RSS because at the early, at the, in his early 20s, I think at the age of 22, he forsook his family and became an adherent, a missionary of the RSS, working very hard over the next several decades before he became chief minister of Orissa. And the question is, of course, there's the personality cult, the projection of his personality, and the undeniable fact that he is the main BJP's vote getter. In fact, one survey before 19, 2019 revealed a serious uh, pre-election survey that about one third of the BJP's support comes from Mr. Modi himself. That's the power of the man, and yet he is a creature of the RSS. He's an adherent of the RSS, and without the RSS and the huge numbers of people who are committed to their mass organizations, dozens of them, he cannot function. This is a dialectical relationship between an authoritarian personality who is charismatic, no doubt, to many of his followers, and the organization itself. And unless we understand this, I don't think we will be understanding the current political situation. There are strengths for him in this, but also big contradictions and weaknesses. And uh, today, looking at the future, which is where I want to skip to that part, because I don't want to take too much more time, the what of the future, future meaning from the present. I don't, to, don't want to make any forecasts. I leave it to others possibly who will, uh, either in their remarks or uh, in answer to questions, may uh, say something about it. But what is what lies ahead? The BJP has gained substantial ground over the past three decades, no question about it. It has emerged as the dominant party in the political system. Its vote share in 2014 in the Lok Sabha election was 31.34%. It increased to 37.38% in the 2019 election. But majoritarian politics rarely translates to a majority of the popular vote in multi-party parliamentary elections, especially in a vast country like India, where diversities of every kind abound and ground realities can change quickly. Even the Congress party in its heyday, which faced no credible opposition at the national level, did not win a majority vote share. And it is significant that the PJP's share of the All India Popular Vote has never touched 40 percent in any Lok Sabha election. And its average vote, vote share, I, I looked at the data, over the 10 general elections it, it contested, or it has contested between 1984 and 2019, is a modest 21.85%. The Congress, by contrast, took a better than 40% share of the popular vote in seven general elections it won between 1951 and 1984, almost reaching the 50% mark, uh, mark in 1984. Of course, it, it was an unusual election after the sympathy, the sympathy wave following the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. But the Congress's historical vote share of 35.6% over 17 Lok Sabha elections is significantly higher than the BJP's 21.85% over 10 Lok Sabha elections. This, I think, suggests an opportunity now or in the conceivable future. Elections are about arithmetic as about anything else. And these numbers suggest that the BJP is far from invincible. If, if only the opposition parties got their act together and pooled their votes optimally. In fact, the BJP has suffered several defeats, including routes when pitted against strong regional parties and coalitions in legislative assembly, as well as Lok Sabha contests at the state level. Tamil Nadu and Kerala have always given the BJP's hopes and prospects short shrift, and I expect that to continue in the coming election. I won't say much about the India bloc. 
it stands for Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance. You know its composition. It has its own problems and internal contradictions, but definitely it's an improvement on what we saw in 2019. And I think it is going to emerge as a potent factor in the current political situation. I don't want to say anything on the economy. I had some notes on it, but I'll leave that to Dr. Prabhakar. But what I want to comment on briefly is the perceived nexus for the BJP government with big corporates. And this has involved a political as well as economic cost. Mr. Modi's closeness to the billionaire Gautam Adani at the Adani group of companies, they were targeted with devastating consequences, as you'll know, as you'll recall, by Hindenburg Research in a report published in January 2023. And this nexus has drawn allegations of cronyism and cover-up. And uh, there's been a furious fight back, not just by Mr. Gautam Adani, he's entitled to defend his empire, but also by the government and many of the institutions of state. And the Supreme Court of India, in a rather curious January 20, 2024 judgment on a writ petition, found nothing basically wrong with the regulation and investigation of the Adani Group's dealings by the Securities and Exchange Board of India, or SEBI. And it noted with untypical humility that, quote, the court must refrain from substituting its own wisdom over the regulatory policies of SEBI. And, and then, for good measure, strangely, directed SEBI and the central government's investigative agencies to probe into whether the loss suffered by Indian investors due to the conduct of Hindenburg Research and any other entities in taking short positions involved any infraction of the law, and if so, suitable action shall be taken. So instead of investigating the, somebody who has been accused of accounting fraud and uh, various other illegalities, it found fault with the whistleblower, the investigator, it appeared, at least on the surface, to uh, whether by taking short positions, they did something wrong. Very, very, and that I think is an example of uh, strange things happening with our institutions. I won't say more on it because out of uh, respect for the Supreme Court, but uh, that decision certainly to me seemed uh, indefensible. And uh, electoral bonds, there's no time for me to go into it. It was a very fine judgment by the Supreme Court, by the five-member judge judgment, and it was admirable the way they followed up. <laughs> Mr. Modi has gone on record very recently in a strange interview to ANI, where uh, the interviewer doesn't ask any questions. The interviewer only wants <laughs> him to put out his views and basically says, yes, yes, please, thank you, brilliant, and so on. And, and, uh, where he has said that uh, political parties and others will come to regret this. This is an Orwellian uh, scenario because the whole electoral bonds were designed for opacity, was defined for cover-up, anonymity. Companies which donated to particular part parties, which encashed the bonds, were given anonymity, and it's now clear, from even from what the Supreme Court said, that the government and its investigative agencies had access to this information, and it is the shame of the top leadership of the State Bank of India that uh, they dragged their feet, they tried to obstruct uh, the actions directed by the Supreme Court, and eventually when it came out, thanks to excellent media research and data analysis, a number of them uh, did it, I'd say the Hindu did it, but also did the other digital news providers like News Minute, the Indian Express, various others contributed to it, entirely thanks to the Supreme Court's judgment that forced the hand of, uh, uh, of the State Bank of India and the government. And Mr. Modi's uh, comment today is, uh, without directly attacking the Supreme Court, he has basically said that uh, it's, it's a hopeless decision. So I think there are many other things that we can say about this, but I want to conclude on this note. Again, 
drawing attention to the values at stake. I think some fault lines are beginning to emerge within the what is known as the Sang Parivar, the RSS and the various satellites that revolve around the RSS, the various organizations. We must not underestimate either their work, their dedication to their cause, if you like, the wrong cause, but they are disciplined, many of them. They frequently flout the constitution and the laws, but they are we cannot afford to underestimate them. But once an a, a group of organizations, institutions like that spread, contradictions are bound to emerge, and we are seeing that in many cases. So what about the relationship between the top BJP leaders and the RSS? Nobody knows. But I think there is some unease about that. As long as Mr. Modi and Mr. Amit Shah are able to deliver on the core RSS demands, then there will be peaceful coexistence, but I'm not sure that the contradictions will not soon overtake them. And this excessive dependence on a leader with no competitor or success in sight, combined with the age factor, because Mr. Modi will be nearly 79. I'm, I'm going to be 79 soon, but he'll be 79 at the end of his next term if he wins the, the next term. And I think they're going to have a huge problem on their hands in finding leaders because one third, rough, this is the finding of uh, uh, polls, one, uh, at least one third of the BJP support comes to for Prime Minister Narendra Modi. To reiterate and sum up, in the current rapidly evolving political situation, the duty of all patriots, all citizens who want India and its 1.44 billion people to do well is to do their utmost to defend our Republican Constitution. This means protecting its letter, its integral values, and its spirit, which are threatened by the Hindutva authoritarian regime and by the Hindu Rashtra project. It means doing everything to safeguard the diverse, pluralistic, and secular character of India and its historical civilization. This includes defending the rights of minorities, especially Muslims, but also others, and as I said, including linguistic minorities. And the issue of Hindi imposition definitely has not gone off the agenda. We have nothing against Hindi as a language, as leaders of the Dravidian movement and others have made clear. But imposition is something that the people of Tamil Nadu and possibly some other southern states will not tolerate. It means protecting our parliamentary democracy, however imperfect it may be, from the offensive launched by the Hindutva authoritarian regime. It means cherishing and championing equality before the law, guaranteed by Article 14. It means defending and fully exercising, without fear or favor, freedom of speech and expression, guaranteed by our Constitution. It means center staging issues relating to the lives, livelihoods, and future of our working class, our farmers, and other sections of our working people and the hundreds of millions who live in poverty and suffer multiple deprivations. It means deeply understanding the interdependence of the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that Dr. Ambedkar brought out, as I mentioned earlier, clearly and powerfully in his last speech to the Constituent Assembly on November 25, 1949. And thank you. I'm sorry if I've exceeded the time limit, but I thought